so I'm just going to do that so we've got it. We we have this knack of having these moments of genius just before we hit record or like pure comedy and it's it's like oh it's gone in the wind. Yeah I know right. I think it's because it must be because we're relaxed we're not like thinking about being recorded but it is it's so refreshing to be on a mum podcast because it's like I can just be relaxed and comfortable in this space where it's like we are all frazzled yeah. yes. well I was telling I was telling my husband because you know I'm trying to get to Ollie to bed he's like I'm really sorry you know that I had that you have to walk out and stuff I'm like Dan if there's two people that are going to understand why I had to walk out it's these yeah. two women here I don't think you should worry yeah I did a podcast episode a little while ago when I was feeling really ill and I had no childcare. It's on International Women's Day. Oh, shit. And I nearly didn't record. And I thought, you know what, guys? My kid is in the room. We're doing it. Like, this is what it means to be a woman. This is not going to be hidden anymore. And uh, just being that authentic that. thing. That episode, you were you were talking about different women in marketing history, weren't, weren't you? Yeah. Yes, were, that was the one, yeah. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that one. Thank yeah, you. Cool. Oh my god, the other well, I had two absolute debacle Zoom sessions <laughs> with the Mile High Content Club. That's like my, my my membership, I guess, coaching program, whatever you want to call it. The first one, yeah, I had both kids home sick, and they, I had to leave the room three times. Like there was just flat out screaming going on. I'm like, I'm sorry, I've got to go. <laughs> and just. And then the next week, well, then, sorry, not the next week, the next month when I had this session, I'm in here and suddenly there's a giant wasp. And I'm like, I'm just You're like, like concentrate, I'm trying to present. I'm like, I was like, sorry guys, but I just had to run out. And my husband was home. Voice that rocks like oh, this. Pedro that was home. So I'm like, come and get this wasp out of here. So I'm trying to present and it's buzzing around and I... I hate wasps like I cannot relax around them I think it was because when I was three years old true story there was a wasp nest outside my window and apparently I don't remember this but mum told me I pushed open the window and it hit the nest and they all came in and she just heard me no. screaming and I was like surrounded by wasps and being stung by them so emotional oh, no. damage <laughs> right I bet the wasps are a lot more like juicy over there as well like we just have little weedy oh, yeah. ones going around we have an Australian zakata killing wasp okay the first time no. I saw this I thought oh, that it was... you're saying <laughs> I was wondering what that word was <laughs> zakata. it is zakata okay Cicada, cicada, potato, potato <laughs> I, I, I have acclimated to the Australian accent it's called a cicada okay <laughs> anyway i i saw this thing for the first time buzz across our driveway on our bush property holding a dead zakata so this thing was the size of my thumb holding a zakata that's this no thing. way yeah can't do it and i can't thought, do it. i thought the army base that's like an hour away had some sick science experiment that had escaped but no <laughs> apparently these things exist and what they'll do is they will burrow under the ground up to a foot under the ground they will find zakatas, stun them, and paralyze them, and bring them into their shelving units that they've made, like Ew. catacombs. It's like a horror movie. Yeah, to slip the zakatas in so that their larvae can crawl up and eat them. That's oh disgusting. Word. Oh my god. Oh my god. Well, I grew up in New Zealand. The phobia has grown in the last two minutes. The phobia has grown. I know, right? I grew up in New Zealand, so we don't have things that kill you. It's yeah. like England. They all, they all just decided to swim polite, across the Polite animals. Right? The street and just hang out here. <laughs> <laughs> oh it's so nice to finally meet you and I'm sorry that it took me so long to make this happen it's been a really funny stage for me in my business because I've been going from not many people know this but I was operating on one day a week of I only had one day a week of childcare, but it was more like nine till three when my eldest was at school so it was really difficult to like be present as a proper business like a solopreneur business not a big thing with only like six hours actual childcare a week but now I've moved like my littlest is going to school three days a week so I have got three days a week now which is like a big shift but like people have been caught in between that phase where it's like oh, I want to be available but I'm like I've got COVID and then this and then you know you know all that crazy stuff so I'm glad we're finally talking. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you, you've done all this with one day of childcare a week. 
Like I have at the moment, I think I have 16 hours a week child free. It's not much. Not much like door to door, right? That's not including if you'd like a lunch break or anything. It's like, yeah. So one day that just. You you find slots, don't you? And that's what the pressure of being a mum is, I think, is that I desperately want to be present with them and I don't want to miss this. Mm. And I find myself doing this, like sneaking off for an hour to do an email campaign while my littlest is watching Peppa Pig. And then I just feel it feels wrong, even though I'm enjoying what I'm doing in the moment. It doesn't feel nice. Yeah. But and 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 I wonder, like, I it's such an unanswerable thing, isn't it? It's like is it guilt that's unnecessary? Guilt is always unnecessary, I believe. Guilt serves no purpose. Guilt doesn't it doesn't do anything for our life. We can be, we can be like, oh, I don't like that I adopted a certain behavior, and going forward, I'm going to try and do a different thing. But guilt is where we berate ourselves, mm-hmm. and I don't believe that serves any purpose in life. In fact, it hinders us because it then makes us having that feeling when we're around our kids means we're not our full true self so beating ourselves up isn't helpful but we do it but yeah I I always wonder like is it just guilt or is it that my body is telling me Jade have boundaries don't run off to do a bit of work when the kids are in front of the tv get stuck in with them and go all in on this experience with having children or is it just you're overthinking it chill you know that's what really torments me as a man Mm. And Maybe I bet it's... not. there's not one father who's ever thought of this. <laughs> I can guarantee I don't it. think as much. No, I don't think as much. I don't think they like zoom in on the day-to-day of it. I think like... When they have dads... to work, they're like, well, I've got to work. Yeah. And off they go. And yeah. there's no thought given. And I guess I'm grossly generalizing here. But they don't, they don't think about, yeah, the child and who's looking after them and what they're possibly missing. It's like, well, I, I have to work. And that's the way yeah. that they've grown up, right? And we've grown up the opposite. Yeah. I think it's just, you know, internalised misogyny. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough to get the balance yeah. there. And like my husband is the main breadwinner. And he's like, he's taken my littlest to forest school now so we can do this because it's 10 in the morning. And I don't really work Tuesdays. So that's gorgeous. But it's not our jet. Ju- and actually there's a really cool person called, Jess, who I was on her podcast, it's called Boss Babies and Bossing It. I can't remember the exact one, but we'll have to link it. Her we, should husband, look, we should look her up. She sounds like the kind of person. She's amazing. Yeah. Business Babies and Bossing It. And it's Jess um, and Cassandra. And Jess is really interesting because her husband did paternity leave. And he is oh, the yes. sole okay. person. And she's full on in business mode. And they're just a really inspiring couple. So yeah, it can happen, but it's certainly not the norm. But I wonder if there's something, I don't like to get too political on like mothers, fathers and genders and stuff, but I wonder if there's something in the fact that me and every mum I know feels torn and like finds it difficult versus the dads, they do what they got to do. They're not necessarily feeling torn generally. Mm -hmm. Like if someone said to me, you have to go back to work at this point, I'd be like, ah, can't. So in a general sense, there will always be incredible exceptions to that, what I've observed. But yeah, I wonder how much of it is cultural and how much of it is bi- a biological thing. I don't know. But yeah. Mm. I know. Mm. It's so hard. Yeah. And you're always, yeah, I do the same thing. I do the sneak off, try and quickly get something done. And then it takes longer than you think you're going to do. And they're there literally like gripping your arm and saying, come on stories and I'm like in a minute in a minute and I find it really hard I don't know if you've experienced this Jade when you just can't do one task from start to finish Mm. that is that is something that just drives me crazy and unfortunately that's their motherhood now right (laughs) like it's you just I think it's hard because it's not their fault it it's not their fault that we're busy but when you're in the middle of doing a task and then they come in on it it's really easy to feel mad at them like you you stop this happening when I know that my boundaries and breaking my boundaries as to what I should be doing and when was the problem and it's not their fault but I can I can feel I'll I'll give a good example I was phoneless I was internetless for a full 10 days because we moved house and we had zero wi-fi and the 4g signal is not very good and it actually terrified me who I was as a mum without wi-fi 
because it was a magical experience. There was never even a temptation, but I'll just quickly check TikTok. I'll just do this. It was like, you can only work when you're in the coffee shop for 10 days. And And it actually really scared me who I was. I was not feeling this rising rage inside me when I was getting distracted by something. I was just present with the kids. I knew I couldn't do anything work-wise. That's funny and that I, you say that because that's what I've resorted to, I think, almost in the last maybe maybe four, eight weeks. It's I only have this time to focus on work. After that, I, I, I can't. Like, I, I actually physically well can't or mentally can't or, like, I've had to set that boundary or even a timer sometimes during the day because otherwise this doesn't get done or this doesn't get done or I can't be the the mom that I've, I've wanted to be. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's like it, uh, the mental load side of it. Like, okay, either I go hard on my business and then my kids don't eat very well because dinner is an afterthought and it's nuggets and waffles and beans again. Or I do feed them really well and I really prepare healthy meals and I plan in advance and it doesn't have to be a big deal, but I'm my brain is there and then my business slips and I haven't responded to some inquiries there isn't really like an answer mm. I think you, you know what the what it was for me was I, I speak two languages at home okay so I'm oh, trying wow. to teach Ollie French at the same time and I noticed that my brain was physically tiring I could feel it physically tiring to the point that I couldn't actually think and so to be able to switch between the two languages I needed that brain power to be able to do that but then also I did not like myself when I would overwork or not work enough and have that guilt so that I just had to go no and you know what it's cost me like my TikTok activity has just gone down the drain so be it <laughs> it's, it's like what what are we even like there's a, a woman called Latasha James who I really recommend following she's hugely successful but I've had coaching with her in the past. And so she's a big YouTuber, big podcaster, like does online courses. She's incredible, but she's really about just consistency and not striving for like being everywhere all the time. And it's like, yeah. we can, we can, we can link this into goals in, in a minute as well. Like, cause I know you guys want to talk about like goal setting. We, we do have a podcast. <laughs> no, yeah, we're just like chatting, but no, like, but keep, keep going. It, like it's probably good stuff in here isn't there but like Latasha talks about this idea like I had coaching with her once and I said you know I, I've got to really be doing four TikToks a day otherwise it's not going to grow and it's not going to be and she said but Jade why why does it need to blow up why does it need why what is this mechanism in me that's like if I'm not doing it the best there's no point doing it at all like what about if I just had five five consulting sessions a month and a steady income stream of two projects why does it have to be this here's how to get a 30k month why does that have to be the case why can't it just four be... figure mom the three figure moms yeah See, so, i was we were talking about I earned this. 80 pounds we, we this been, month we were talking about this this morning and i i'm actually going to do a parody video about how to how to be how to create a three figure business <laughs> <laughs> like say like, all the, the mistakes that you make essentially because yeah I think there's a lot of that pressure especially if you are like I mean and I know you spend a lot of time on TikTok is this I've got a six-figure business I've got a seven-figure so business and as much as you're like oh whatever and the bro marketing and stuff I think it does kind of tap it does get there. to you definitely yeah. I I definitely find myself having like a perfectionist brain so it's like how do I become the biggest B2B influencer? How do I, it's like, why? Why do you need that? What, what, what is that for? And I think the thing to remember is like, so I'm in my 30s and like my kids are five and two and like the next 10 years, I don't want to miss that. But in 10 years, in 20 years, I'm still only in my early 50s. Why does it have to be everything now? And it's almost like sometimes I want to quit completely. Like I am not working at all, close all the accounts or it's got to be all in. Like, where is this crazy thing? I suppose what's difficult for us is the algorithms and stuff. If we're not consistent, they do just forget us. So it's very easy to say, oh, just do one or two posts a week. But these days, they're not 
it, it just doesn't get us off the ground. And it's like, we're entrepreneurs, but I feel like we work for algorithms. I feel like they're our boss, like pushing us around and demanding of us. So yeah, it's what I, I had to stay away from going into that kind of debate with a couple people today because they said, yeah, okay, well, it's all well and good that you want to help the LinkedIn algorithm see your stuff. But what you are forgetting is, is that they're telling you to do this because they need your content. And also they're telling you not to put links in your posts. Why? Because they don't want people hopping off. It's all for their agenda. So what's the advantage to you? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it it is, I think, I think as mums, I think for me and, you know, when it comes to goals, it's like goals can be very demotivating. I love the idea of creating habits that are realistic and sustainable so I have a bad habit at the moment where I'll go hard at TikTok for a few weeks and then I'm so burnt out that I don't post for a few weeks or a week, which is a big thing when you're a regular TikTok post, that's a big thing. And I'll notice the engagement drops right down. It's like, stop going so hard at this thing. Like the goal was, okay, reach 20,000 followers on TikTok by spring. And I'm, I've nearly achieved it. But what I tried to do was stop obsessing about that goal and that measurement and start obsessing over habits and what it's going to take to go in a general direction rather than I have to hit that number. And that's just so self-defeating. It's like, oh, no, I didn't. It's like, well, I've landed on almost 19,000 by summer. So does that mean I failed on 20,000 by spring? That feels very demotivating and self-berating, but the habits were there. It's like, be be consistent, be regular, respond to the community, keep going with it. And then you end up in a good place because of that commitment to that habit. Yeah. And it's, that feels better and it's something you can do. Because what if TikTok shuts down your account tomorrow? Mm Mm-hmm. You don't have those 20,000 people anymore, but you've still got the good habits that you created. So I think absolutely, regardless, you've won in that sense, right? I think that's, yeah, pat yourself on the back. God, you're doing way better than me. I do the same thing and as much as I teach my students not to do this, but I, I create content. I get really excited. So I want to push it all out at once. And then I'm like, oh, I've got none left. <laughs> like, I can't be bothered creating. Yeah, like space it out. I know. Right? I know. Yes. I'm just like, oh, I've done four a day for a week. Let's just keep going with this. And it's like, yeah. no, no, keep, keep them in drafts and one <laughs> a day or two a day, you know. And I know that sounds like a lot, but TikTok is, for me has worked really well as a match for who I am and how I create content. So I'm not very good with Instagram. I'm not very good with beautiful curation. I can do it and I can sit there and I can figure out to do it. But my natural thing would be like, grab the phone, chat to you for three minutes. It's done in three minutes. Edit it for four minutes out. I think you've already answered then one of the kind of side questions that we had, because what I wanted to say to you, this was something that I popped in in the document was, Jade's on TikTok a lot and I'm impressed with her level of consistency, especially as a mum. And so I said to Clem, I just want to ask her like what she's doing, like how she's doing that. So I think I love that you say that you've just leaned into the platform and the content type that you actually really enjoy making. And then you are able to be pretty consistent. Maybe you go, you know, you're doing more sometimes and less other times, but that's really normal, I think, too. And what's good about TikTok is that you those posts have some longevity thanks to the search. So even if you do take a few weeks off and don't post as much, some of that older content is still being picked up. I have a post yeah. that every single day I'm still getting people, I can see they've liked it or saved it. That post was from the end of 2019, I think. And it's when I got music on my Instagram stories and it's a green screen and I look really ugly in it, which is super annoying. But every single day it's still getting traction. And that was from years ago. So this is what I I like about TikTok is that, so a really good example here of how the platform works well for me is I did a video once where I'd gone to an influencer event in London and I, and I edited it for maybe six hours because I'd caught footage at the event and I wanted to really make it look good and like do you know what I'm going to do what these big influencers do where they're like look at my day in the life in London with like a cool trendy sound and I posted it 
and it got 13 likes. Oh, and then there was a day, I know, there was a day where I was in my car and I was in a sweater because I'd been to the gym and I was feeling quite emotional because a friend had had some bad news and they were just in a bad way. And I was just thinking, reflecting on the fact that the world is a tough place and why are we worrying about marketing? And I just picked up my phone and I said, you know what? I promise that what you're going through right now is not as big a deal as it feels. Things are going to get better. It's not as, you know, this company's running around acting crazy. It's not a big deal, is it? Come on. And and it got, I think it's up to like nearly a third of a million views, thousands of comments. 40,000 likes it's not about that stuff like I I always I love the mantra of create content you would want to watch and it really doesn't matter how many people like it or not that doesn't doesn't take away from the art of it but it just goes to show that that two minute clip that I just spoke from the heart on was so much more resonant to and I don't think it's a a coincidence I looked like junk it was real when I look all made up like today I've been like right put makeup on and I'll make sure I look nice for the day but when we look real I think TikTok prefers that and so on Instagram I've just always felt like I'm not really being authentic to me because I'm not this polished person but yeah back to your point on TikTok I think that because people will sometimes say to me what do I need to do for TikTok to work for me and I think it's the one platform that unless you truly go for it with the culture of the platform and how TikTok likes to edit it and exactly how it likes the captions, it just sometimes feels like it doesn't work. So we have to trim off those intros. We have to be bang into the point. And the best tip that I can give for TikTok, that I think summarizes all of it, is that with, and I do this with every video pretty much that I create, is I imagine my friend has sent me a text, a WhatsApp to say, Jade, how does this work? And I've gone, I can't be bothered to reply. And I've just gone, so what you need to do, and like literally like holding my phone like I would with a friend, if I'm doing, I, I think not trying to make myself do things because sometimes people try to be doing their makeup while talking, which is really difficult because I've done that. I've been like, oh, you need to make it look like, you're, like if you happen to be doing something else, like putting your drink down, fine. But just speaking to that phone literally as if it's your friend, it works really well because you don't overthink it. But yeah, I think it's just been a platform for me that has come naturally. I wanted to be an actress when I was a kid. So lips, lip syncing, rapping along to stuff is just something that would have been a talent. I might, I don't mean a talent, but I just mean like that might have been a career route I'd have gone, like being a children's TV presenter or something cringe like that. So <laughs> that side of it just comes fairly naturally. But yeah, I just enjoy it, I guess. Yeah, that's the main thing. I think if you pick content and content styles that you enjoy, you're going to do more of it. So you're going to get better at it. You're almost going to like hyper focus into it, right? Because you're like, okay, I really enjoy TikTok. I like, you know, the trends that are happening there and the culture. So you're going to spend more time consuming and thinking about it and you're going to then end up with a better result. So it makes sense. It also makes sense, I think, that that post that you did in your hoodie performed really well because you made an emotional connection and we were speaking with Megan Gersh and Lauren Tassie Tassie I should say on the podcast a couple of episodes ago about that and it was Lauren who was saying you really need to make that emotional connection so that's I reckon that's why rather than the beautifully polished six hours of editing which is such a shame though because I feel how much you put into that and it's yeah you could try it's hard though because you, you never know right <laughs> like, and again work. when people say like when people say you need to make that emotional connection it's like it's really hard because you have to do it in the moment you're feeling inspired mm -hmm. so when people say do you batch your content I'm like yes when I go oh my gosh, something's hit today, I'm feeling it, I'm going to yeah, get that focus. camera out. But if you're like, right, on Thursday at two o'clock, I'm blocking two hours out and I'm going to create my TikToks. If you're like this morning, I would not be, I'm not in a place to create TikToks. I know I'm not. And I think for women as well, there's something about our cycle. I don't know. I was talking to one of my clients about this. She's a fertility health psychologist and she says the same thing. She's like, no, they you got to be in your... I don't know what they're called but like there's a stage in our cycle where we're in a bit of a sparkle mode where we're like charismatic and then there's other times where we're quite heavy and like I notice that if I do videos in that stage of my cycle 
my face is more like heavy. Whereas if I'm like, this is fun. I'm in my sparkle place. So I don't know. I, we I were feel talking it. about this this morning. Oh again. my gosh. You've read our mind today, yeah. Jade. I was hey, saying how it's Clem, like. Clem, sorry. Yeah. Just, sorry. I've just interrupted you. Trying to thought, move your mic a bit closer. You're sounding really quiet. It looks phallic. That's why I didn't. I know. Move it to I the know. Front. But. There. Is that You better? need to prop up your screen more because I've got mine here. Look, we've all got the same mic. How cute is that? Yay. I actually <laughs> bought a Shure MV7 recently and then left it in London. Oh, so they sent it back to me. Oh, shall we record this? <laughs> we are recording. We're recording. Oh, right. yeah. I, I figured that we were doing the podcast now. <laughs> we're, we're recording. All right. Shall we, shall we introduce you at least? No, but yeah, you, you were saying this morning about this whole cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. So I was talking to my fertility health psychologist client who obviously that's that's what she does like and she's dealing with mental health and and reproductive systems at the same time and she was saying that yes it is a fact that you have these creative waves with with your hormone levels during your cycle and i was saying that it's like one to four days after the auntie has gone i just go like, yeah it's, me too it's like i have to plan projects around that time that I know that I'm going to have to do that most deep creative work. And it's tricky to do, but somehow I've done it. I don't know how. I think we need to block that in our calendars, actually. Yeah. I'm going to get my yeah. tracker app, actually, and look what days they are, because it is very true, and then maybe batch over those few yeah, days. Just, just keep an eye for the next few months when those waves are, and you'll find a correlation within the cycle. I think you feel unstoppable, don't you? Yeah, yeah, you do. I think and then when it goes, you're like, about, what was sorry. that? No, you're okay. talking at the same time, sorry. Nah. <laughs> I was going to say, I think there's an episode about it on Jenna Kutcher's podcast. Okay. I'll yeah. Mm. Interesting. All right. All right. Shall we get some 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 podcast questions and, and interview going? Do you yeah, want me to read the we, intro? Better better introduce Jade, hey? <laughs> <laughs> That's Jade, right. And we Jade, can... you were happy with all the questions and all that stuff. Like, yeah. I, like even that then, like I figured you had just gone into it and that's like for oh. you know content we can use. So yeah, yeah you yeah. you lead me and I will answer whatever you need. Everything is good. Okay. All right, cool. Just to warn you, I usually fuck up the intro at least twice. <laughs> Honestly, you, I usually I usually time. record mine afterwards because I just I I melt. I'm like I don't know how to introduce you, but yeah, you All guys right. are more organized than me. <laughs> here, here goes here goes nothing. We've all heard it before. It's on nearly every single marketing one-on-one course, website, lead magnet, and even blogs and TikTok. The key to any successful marketing strategy is having your plan, your goals, your objectives in place first before you execute said plan. And more likely than not, if, you're, if you've done that marketing one-on-one course, downloaded that lead magnet, or read that blog, you've heard what a SMART goal is. But what if we told you for B2B businesses, SMART goals are not so smart. And in fact, it actually can be inhibiting you from reaching your goals when it comes to marketing your business. How to develop a killer marketing plan and why SMART goals are not necessarily the right fit for every B2B business is exactly what we're talking about today on this episode of the Mad Marketing Moms podcast with our special guest, Jade Tambini. Jade is a B2B marketing consultant who has been in the biz for nearly 20 years. Jade helps small to mid-sized B2Bs get sustainable growth through expert marketing strategies and brand positioning. She's also a dedicated TikToker and the host of the B2B Marketing Gap podcast, as well as a brand ambassador for Adobe. Welcome, Jade. Please tell us more about yourself, you know, now that we've been talking for about half an hour now, chit-chatting, and what led you to becoming a B2B marketing specialist. And we do want to know the story about how you became a brand ambassador for Adobe. Congratulations, by the way. That's a huge win. Amazing. Oh, thanks. You guys are too nice. We should hang out every day. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so my, my journey was that I, I started in sales in 2006, moved into marketing in 2009 after 11 failed interviews. I was told, you can't be a marketer, you're just a sales girl with no education. And I just had this passion. I was like, I'm doing this. And that's kind of always just stuck with me. Whenever someone's like, 
you can't just do that. It's like, watch me if it's something I want to do. So started in marketing in 2009 and worked my way up in a big corporate, a big PLC, a global corporate organization into a head of marketing role. I then spent a bit of time as marketing director for a more regional business. And I had a difficult experience in a corporate organization. And I was like, oh my gosh, crisis. I can't be a marketer. I'm useless. I'm terrible. Everything they said was true. I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to apply for a different type of career and I'm just going to quit. And it really got to me. And then an old boss was like, are you kidding me? You're meant to be in marketing. Like, don't be crazy. And what sort of happened is I ended up setting up Tambini Marketing in 2016. A few people had been asking me for marketing advice and asking me who could help them. And then one day I just said, do you know what? I can help you with that. And it just kind of grew. And so I guess where I've ended up now is that since becoming a mum, I started to reflect on the type of work I was doing. And it was like always like virtual marketing manager service when I started and retainers and kind of being an in-house, outhouse marketing person for a few businesses. And it just became a bit unsustainable. And I learned something that I loved consulting, advising and guiding, but I hated delivering. So I decided to monetize the consulting part. It was like, I'm not having all these free calls to then do a quote for a piece of work I don't want. I'm going to monetize the calls. So I now offer just one service, strategy calls, like book in, we talk, see you again, I can set you up with the partners you need to deliver. And that's the business. And so it's it's arrived at a place where I am for B2B marketers. I reflect on that experience I had where I wasn't treated how I would want to be, where I was undervalued, where marketing wasn't seen as the growth engine of the business. And maybe my experience didn't match that either. We had this this gap between the owners of the business and the marketing efforts. And I just thought I can really help marketers. I can help close this gap so I can advise CEOs and consult, mentor and guide and be a crutch to marketing managers And that's how I'm kind of filling that gap. And that's what the business has become. I guess the Adobe one was like an accident. I've done a one, you know, one piece of work as an Adobe partner recently at this summit. It was that they'd sort of seen my TikTok and thought, right, this person would be great to make our real life summit more online, more digital. So it was kind of mind blowing that pretty much the first brand partnership I've been offered was Adobe. It was a bit like, no, I'm supposed to do like not great ones first, surely. So that was really fun experience. I don't want my whole business to be that type of stuff. Like if it's Adobe, if it's someone like that and it's like exciting and it's a couple of times a year, lush, you know, great. But I don't want to end up being a paid content creator because at the heart of it, it, it is inauthentic. I don't mean it's fully inauthentic. But when you have a contract to say how many posts you're going to share, you kind of have to do that. And you know that it's for that brand. And while your heart is 100% in it, like all of the Adobe content you have seen, my heart was in it. I was having the time of my life. And that is why I would never do a brand partnership that I wasn't in love with. But I think that if I did that every day, it would become just this machine of like, I'm just talking about this person for money, this person for money. I, I want my content to be like, oh. Let's just spill, you know? It becomes a job. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, instead of a true love, right? (laughs) I want to do TikTok because I'm throwing something out there that I'm feeling. I don't, you know, when you're you're representing a brand, you have to be very conscious. You have to get sign off. You have to make sure that you're not saying anything inappropriate, that you're not meant, you know, it like an Adobe work unbelievable to work with as as partners there's so much creative freedom I don't imagine every brand deal offers that but yeah I think probably four or five a year will be perfect of that type of thing yeah that's so cool oh my god well yeah incredible next thing you'll have Oprah knocking on your door or something <laughs> I <highly> doubt it <laughs> keep this up before we talk about the mechanics of b2b marketing I want to ask you about The Void, which is something that you speak about on your podcast. Can you take us through that? What do you mean by The Void? My understanding is it's like a lack of strategy or connection between directors and people on the board with junior marketers. Is is that, is that correct? Would love to hear a little bit more about that and I guess why it's an issue. Yeah, so I started to see a common trend in 
small and medium sized organizations where they are expecting marketing managers. So it doesn't even have to be marketing assistants. They're expecting marketing managers to get results void of any strategy. And I think it all stems back to the job description. So you kind of find that marketers get a bit trapped because at interview stage, it's like, hey, this is a job spec. You need to be responsible for content, PR, strategic alignment with sales. You need to be responsible for leads. You need to be responsible for web, social, digital, without saying, and you will have all of the necessary outsourced specialists doing this, and then you will orchestrate a predefined strategy. It's more, you will do all of this. And so what happens is marketers go, yeah, I've done that. I've done social. I've done digital. I've had experience with this and everything we're coached is when you are preparing for an interview, make sure you provide relevant experience based on every element of that plan. And what else can you do? You can't say, oh, I haven't actually done eight of those 12 things because your competitor will say, I have done all of those things. And we kind of blow up our expertise, which is normal. You know, you're not lying. You're, you Maybe you did the social media for an event once, and then you say, expertise covers event management, you know, digital strategy, whatever. We're trained to do that. And so then you join the business, and then you go, hey, I don't have the resources to cover all these bases. And when you're asking me for leads, I don't know how I'd even start getting those because I'm on this task wheel of doing everything you've asking me. And they go, but hey, you said you could do all this. Hey, you you signed up for this. Just work harder. And that is the B2B marketing gap in practice, in real life. That happens daily. I have had people crying to me on sessions, on the marketing mentoring sessions, like no matter how hard I work, nothing seems to happen. And it's like, look, the reason it's not working is you have the board of directors and there is no marketing representation on that board. And if there is, it's a person who's from a sales background. And that is a real problem because they don't understand marketing. They they reduce it down to get leads, which is not what marketing is only about. Marketing is satisfy customer needs profitably. There's some clients where they just need to understand, are our clients happy with us and how do we retain them better and then grow a few more too, where People are obsessed with leads. They're forgetting about clients. They haven't spoke to them for five years. They don't know if they're happy or not. They're losing clients and obsessing over getting first place on Google, which can be part of a strategy, but it's just this obsession with leads and the lack of understanding of how strategy needs to drive growth in marketing and ill-equipped marketing managers. You know, we're doing everything we can. We, We think that doing a bunch of tactics will lead to growth, but when it doesn't, we feel disheartened and demotivated. So what we need to plug that gap is we need real marketing directors who actually have delivered strategies in the past. And where they haven't, we need external consultants who can create marketing strategies and go, hi guys, here's how to deliver on this. Why Why do you think that is that CEOs, C-suite or management don't understand what marketing is? Is it because marketing is maybe a field that's relatively new in the grand scheme of, of, I guess, time and civilization? Or is it because marketing's not necessarily physical, it's really more psychological than anything? What, why I, do you think that they have that belief that they don't really value? Well, when you, when you look at B2C and the fact that marketing is like probably the most valued element in B2C brands, it, it all comes back to the fact that B2B companies have traditionally been able to grow without marketing. When you really think about it, if you've got like a law firm in a region, the, the traditional model did work where it was sales and relationships first, and then marketing started to come in to support with collateral and materials, and then eventually in like the... 2010s you know it was like oh we do need websites actually so that people can just verify that we're professional and somewhere around 2008 2010 like the leaders of businesses now the CEOs kind of stopped they were like this is what works and outreach was working and just personal relationships alone was working but what they haven't reflected on and realized is that people buy differently today So, you know, there's a lot of very good research from Forrester, from Gartner about purchasing behaviors today and people are missing such big opportunities. So something like a buying group, there's a decision making group in a B2B company, say they're going to buy a new accounting software. 
say there's six people involved in that decision or even 10, there's research to show that each of them will research the impact on their department and what's going to be important to them. And they will come to meetings armed with four or five pieces of content and data, not necessarily like here's a white paper I read, but more like I've researched this and these are the things important in my part of this decision. Whereas in the past, all you had access to was, okay, we'll set up three calls with three suppliers and we'll all ask loads of questions at the expert and they're the source of information for us. What reps are not understanding is that that information exists due to the internet and they think that they're the only source of information, but they're not anymore. And so when people say, why is no one clicking on our pay-per-click advert? Why is no one asking us to work with them anymore? It's like, because you're not serving their needs before they're ready to speak to a rep. Yeah, they the, the relationship. Yeah, and the other piece of data that blew my mind from Gartner, just to share this quickly, was that six a, a, a buyer will today, a B2B buyer, in a general sense, obviously it's going to vary per industry, a buyer will only spend 16% of their decision-making time speaking to any given sales rep. And that gets even better or worse then if you consider that they speak to three or four vendors, that means each individual brand has got 5% of their decision-making time and that is it. And people think it's like, oh, they speak to four suppliers. We've got 30% of their time. It's absolutely not the case. No. And that just blew my mind because businesses are not set up for this. And mm. this is a big issue. Another thing that I've seen happen a lot and I've heard about this is – because of the different way that we shop now and buy things. Previously, the sales team were making the sales. But now, because there's a lot more happening online in terms of that research that you were just speaking about, in terms of actually buying as well, that responsibility for making the sales and even back to getting the leads has suddenly come over to the marketing department. And so the marketing department are effectively doing both teams jobs or there's certainly that overlap that perhaps there wasn't previously and perhaps some of those managers who were back in 2008 are still thinking you know like that absolutely yeah, it's, it's really and I think interesting. there's a miss a misplaced pressure so what's happening is that I consult I speak to marketers who yes they're on a task wheel and they're getting berated by sales where's the leads where's the leads where's the leads and it's just nonsense but when I ask I've asked a few marketers recently, where is the pressure to get work on the business? Who's under pressure to get work? It's always sales. But sales today need to be our closers, our human experts who come in at the right point. The pressure, as much as we need to be set up properly for growth, actual growth needs to be on marketing now. I don't mean this to be like a marketing manager should be under pressure to get growth. They're an operational person to deliver on a strategy. But there was another absolutely incredible stat. And I'm sorry, guys, but I've just read so many amazing stats recently. No, please. Oh, my gosh, it's amazing. McKinsey, there's a new report out by McKinsey, and they found that 27% of B2B buyers would spend up to half a million dollars without speaking to a person at all. 27% is quite a big number, right? It's a quarter. Now, this is what led me to think. I reckon that business to business is all about relationships is the biggest myth in B2B history because, right, it's all about relationships. It's not, it's never been about relationships. It's been about where do I access the information I need that has to be an expert. I can't get it anywhere else. Nobody wants to sit on a four hour Zoom call to figure out what they need to know. Nobody's ever wanted that. They had to do it. And so today, I bet you anything that 27% of buyers are millennials and Gen Z who understand, who buy differently and are used to being served online. You know, our B2C buying habits when we're consumers definitely influence what we expect as B2B buyers. Our frustration tolerance reduces for ineffective things like a rep not knowing that we're already clued up about a solution. It's like, you don't need to tell me that. I've got final questions for you. I know what I need. I know what I want. Mm. I've read what you do. I've read about the problem. I've consulted with others, the same situation as me and my networks. And that for me is the biggest missed opportunity. Everyone is so scared to be fully strategic and 
all in on their marketing and they still, they'll pay a million dollars, a million pounds a year on their sales team. They've got 15 sales reps all on targets. They'll spend a million on that to get 10 million in sales. And then the marketing budget is like a hundred grand. It's like, why don't you have fewer salespeople closing all day long and have a million pound marketing budget? Like you would get more and your brand would get you in front of more people and you'd close more opportunities. I completely agree with you. My my partner's mainly in sort of like procurement and such, and he's always talking about like it's all about relationships because he, he's in the thick of it with when it comes to B2B and, and finding the right solution, et cetera. Every single time when it's when it's a rep that he knows that he's like, I know I can count on this person and it's not the relationship, it's the fact that he can call them and they'll get it done or they'll answer the question immediately. Mm-hmm. People don't have time to go and spend hours upon hours upon hours upon hours researching across several different areas. They need to find that one source of truth that they can rely on and build that relationship through it So Mm -hmm. to the point that they can just go, yep, hey, I need this. Two minute phone call, it's done. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I, I love that. And like, it's not saying that people are dead. It's saying that there are more efficient ways to get in front of more people Also utilizing subject matter experts, like my business is a hundred percent inbound and people are buying into me, but I'm not one-on-one consulting every single person in order to make them a customer. I'm doing a mass consulting with the webinars. There might be a hundred people on there or the TikToks. It's not, I'm not saying humans go and, but it's about how do we make that thing that your husband feels be the later down the line experience. And how do we replace anything that is done manual and human with a marketing setup. So absolutely, there will be times when your husband needs to speak to that expert, just needs to, no two ways about it. But how do we make that expert more efficient and able to cover more clients and your husband only have to speak to that person when he really needs to? I guarantee, because my husband's the same, I said to him, I guarantee there will be things that could be sorted for you without that person but you just haven't experienced that yet. So you don't realize it's kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's all about a bit of that trust building. I'm going to play devil's advocate. (laughs) Love it. I feel like stirring the pot right now. Let's do this. Let me guess why marketing doesn't get the budget, but the sales team does. Who works in marketing? Predominantly women. Who works in sales? Quite often it's men. I'm I'm generalizing grossly here, but I'm just having flashbacks to my corporate days, who was on what teams, who was valued and paid more, who got commissions, who were the people who were working late in the office every single night because I did social media as kind of a side job. I was actually the events manager in that role and it will be me there organizing the events until midnight and the marketing team were there. The sales team weren't there, that's for sure. So, yeah, I think there's a little bit of that going on too in terms of the board and what they're valuing and all of this mixed up. In and it. I, think a, I think sometimes it is like it's really hard to know if I've ever faced sexism at work because I have worked with amazing people And I think what's happened is probably like a culture subconscious bias, which we all have. And I think it's dangerous to say that we don't. We have to be aware of them and counteract them. I think given my experience coaching women, they definitely find it more difficult to have a voice. And I think, you know, my podcast episode on how to have a voice in marketing as a woman, once I decided to use fact, data, stats to raise a case for marketing, me being a woman didn't hold me back, but I certainly remember times where I had to overcome a hurdle of like, actually you're gonna hear me. I once went to a meeting in somewhere in Europe, I can't remember where, and the marketing assistant went with me. I was the head of marketing at the time. And we went into a room full of men and they all shook his hand and said, it's so great to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. To him, assuming he was my boss and I was like the PA, and it was the meeting. It was it was it wasn't even like they were doing it. It was like a weird subconscious thing. I've noticed it even with me. I'll say, you know, so you've got a CEO, and maybe he will say this. It's like 
why are you doing that? So I'll make a conscious effort to say she. Anytime I talk about a CEO, I'll just say she because it's like I know I've got that subconscious bias and I'm going to counteract it. And so in that example, in that meeting, I knew that in the first 10 minutes, I have to set my stall out. I have to get the big hard hitting data at them and then they're going to bring me into the fold. But if I sit back and go, oh, it's so great to meet you and don't push through that barrier, then I'm just going to be treated as like no one. And and that's a sad truth. And I don't know if it's changed since I was in corporate 10 years ago, but it's certainly there. Mm. Yes, stirring the pot. I'm loving it. Um, and we will link to that podcast episode. So you how to find your voice as a woman will pop it in the show notes as well. So you can go and have a listen to that. Mm. As well as the reports. I think you, you quoted three different reports that I think I've read one of them and I found it fascinating. The, just the evolution of, of what we're going through right now is just absolutely fascinating. I think it was the McKinsey one that I read. I've had some coaching clients literally say, I shared the Gartner Future of Sales 2025 report with my bosses. We've now doubled the budget. We're ready to go. Let's do this. It's that transformative. Getting stuff like that in front of leaders, even if you don't have the assertiveness to go, hey, it's kind of like, do you know what? I'm not strategic. We need to fill this gap. Please read this report. I think it will be enlightening for you. Even just that is like, oh there's a change Mm. yeah rolling rolling back to before change happens what what is like the biggest mistakes that you see businesses making within their b2b marketing number one is using agencies incorrectly so hiring tactical specialist marketing agencies and expecting them to overcome the challenge. So you get an SEO company or a pay-per-click company and you think that you're just going to get sales. But Chris Walker from Refine Labs had a great point. He said, online advertising doesn't guarantee sales. It guarantees you get in front of people. It's an amazing point. And so there's a much bigger piece to that. Also, the second one is ridiculously low budgets that you can't even get off the ground with. So I typically suggest four to eight percent of revenue as long as there's a healthy profit margin. Companies are like, oh, my budget's 0.4 percent or two percent. The problem with this is that like also people dive straight into tactics with that budget, but it's about getting the foundations first. So most B2B companies I consult with, they haven't done the foundational work, which includes brand positioning and brand narrative, which can firms here is why we're the better choice for you over the other options available in line with your frustrations and things you've experienced as roadblocks in the past number two is creatively expressing that so having the visuals that bring that message to life a lot of the time people just go to a design company and say create me a brand and then they go what's your message I don't know you create it for me and then they just go we are so whoever accounting and like that's the message so that's one The budgets, yeah, so we don't have the money to get the positioning, the creative, the web strategy right, the CRM and data, you know, sign up dashboards so we can really measure what's going on, getting all these basic foundational pieces in and the creation of a marketing strategy so that we've got a documented, here is how we're going to get to where we need to be from where we are now with the least available resources. Let's do less. Let's do less things really well. And then the other one is the B2B marketing gap. It's like expecting mid-level marketers to be strategic and then being frustrated when they aren't. There was one more as well. It was a really big one. I can't really remember, but I think those cover off the main points. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's it. Doing too many things. So being in too many places, trying things out for a minute. So for me, like my podcast, I, it was a full year before it started to be what I wanted it to be, which was people going, I've booked in with you because of your podcast. Mm. I didn't go very hard on it. I was sleep deprived. I would say to people, you know, you need to give it a good go for six to nine months and really go for it and make sure the content's relevant. So people go, oh, email marketing didn't work for us. We did some campaigns. We got no leads. We tried that. It didn't work. We tried pay-per-click advertising, but it didn't work. And it's like, yeah, because you used 500 pounds a month for three months and you didn't even get enough data to understand if it would work so it's really about like it's not the tactics it's the approach and the lack of consistency and persistence that's the Mm. biggest misunderstanding I find is that's in in not just in b2b in in general is that marketing is a long game it is a never-ending game of chess shoots and ladders and I don't know minecraft put together (laughs) 
Whatever yeah, and your I think games and... are, it's all of them put together, as well as that field of Lego that you're walking through, right? It's it is such a long game, and it does not end. And so many people misunderstand that that it's not you go and do one thing, and that's it. Everything is solved. And I think yeah, they do that. They put all the eggs in one. Oh, let's try this one now. Let's try that one now. And yes, you can have short term wins. Like I've had clients who are obsessed with getting leads. I was like, but guys. You don't have a CRM system. You've quoted for 2,000 jobs over the last 10 years. You have all these contacts of people who never worked with you but are probably frustrated with what they're doing right now. Let's reactivate those people to get some quick wins and some opportunities on the board. Let's re-engage all those people and alongside that do the long-term brand building stuff. But sadly, people don't have the confidence to see it through. They're just scared to, to really, and it's got to be a mix of, of direct marketing outreach and brand building as well. People are scared. Mm, and it's like, you know, this the obsession with leads is very much like the obsession with followers, isn't it? Cool, you get all these leads, but then what? You get all these yeah. followers, but then what? What does that actually mean for your business? And like you were saying, if you don't have the systems to back that up, well, what's why are we doing this? What's what's the point? Absolutely. So looking then at, we've just reviewed perhaps some of the mistakes <laughs> that people are making. What should small businesses or B2B businesses really be focusing on in terms of their goals and their objectives, you know, at any stage of their business? And I, I guess probably we should just like, I'll, give a bit of a recap on what I meant because you guys originally found me and were like oh this is interesting when I did a bit of a an attack on smart goals on TikTok and you're like <laughs> I loved it <laughs> oh this is spicy like you guys like a bit of spice I think we're always spilling the tea <laughs> I like spice, spice when other people do it <laughs> it's quite <laughs> yeah. scary when you do it yourself but yeah it was a bit of a one-off thought and it's not like I'm like oh smart goals are dead that awful like HubSpot I've got a great article saying about how to use them and reasons why they're used incorrectly and how to you know pitfalls and stuff so I think probably the problem with them is misuse of them because really goals are never going to be a bad thing are they like having goals to work toward but some of the things that I think are not great about this model so obviously it's simple measurable attainable relevant and timely mm -hmm. is that they often are linked to very concrete targets now I'm going to get to a better model in my opinion that still makes sure that you are aiming for something because you can't just run marketing going oh we'll just see what happens I mean I do because I know that my model's working and I've not got set targets and I'm doing better by having good habits actually than I probably would with a target-based approach that's okay for me to say as a solopreneur whereas if you've got a corporate who's like Here's your marketing budget. What are you going to achieve? Ah. But the problem is it makes us obsessed with the concrete target, not the bigger issue. We all often this set wrong and unrealistically. So I coached a client once who was like, I've been given the goal to double the number of opportunities that were at decision stage in the pipeline. Wow. Okay. And what's the budget for that? Oh, no, it's the same. I'm like, so you're going to have the same resources available and you need your goal is to double it. Well, good luck. I mean, obviously that's really demoralizing and unrealistic. So that's a really common issue. And again, very demotivating. You could have done a really great job. Like you can't predict with a science, typically marketing in very large corporates where you've got a lot of data to play with. You can predict a lot easier, but you have to see how things go, test and scale. So it's like, we ideally would like to see this type of result. Oh, great. That came in. Let's up the budget a bit and let's see how much more we can get. But once you're like, it has to be 50 of this and then you get 48 or next time 60. It's sort of bad. Like I had a webinar where 16, come on, next one was 130 it's sort of like you learn from that. It's like, oh, was it the topic? I didn't go, I failed on that webinar. It's like in a general sense, we need to be growing and we need to be doing that. Often they're far too tactical. So when even in the HubSpot article that I hope we can link, when they give examples of the, the smarts they were setting, they're always tactical. It's like generate this number of web visitors, generate this, that, and the other. And unfortunately what that does is it makes you just obsessed with the wrong thing. I think people should be obsessed with how much growth are we directly getting. So maybe we want to be using them later 
into that process of like, okay, how are we measuring success? And the other one that came up in that HubSpot article is that they can lead to us losing sight of the company and of the customers. It's just so in on your one. I don't care as long as I get 20,000 visitors to the website, because that then means this number of signups, that then means this number of clients. It's like you just kind of move away from the rest of the business. And so that was my beef with them. It was like, it just, (laughs) that stuff. But also, I don't know a marketer who doesn't just find it an absolute brain frazzle to try and do them. It kind of just feels like it boxes you. It's like, attainable, relevant. What are you talking about? Like, what? (laughs) It's just really complicated. And I felt like it took objectives away from the actual planning. So I just, I just ditched them and was like, it's just not for me. As an example for our listeners, a smart goal could be like, you know, receive 20 leads within two months. It it can be, I mean, that's a very simple smart goal, but. Well, that's the ones that show up. It, it can be like down to tactical stuff. Like if you know that for every 10,000 visitors you get to your website, you end up with a big key account client. So then the argument would be like, we need to get 30,000 relevant visitors to our our website which will equal three big accounts because we you know but a lot of the time unfortunately people go for that but they don't have the strategy to follow on from that so they don't know that that will lead to that many accounts because they don't have insights dashboards they don't have the metrics to turn the nurturing to turn them into a client they just become obsessed with if I get more visitors to the website I get more leads even if they're rubbish quality leads I just need that I just need to get this goal achieved And so I really recommend that people read the book Atomic Habits by James Clear because it talks, he's, yeah, he's quite anti-goals and it's really about like these 1% improvements and like habit forming, being very consistent. And I, I love that, but you know, I do have a model to follow for setting goals. It's not like I'm saying don't have goals because that's really unrealistic, but I think the process I follow is a bit more down to earth and connected with the business strategy rather than just being zoomed in on marketing. Can you take mm. us through that yes. that that setup? And, and I thought you might why... say that. <laughs> and and can you can you take us through that setup and tell us like why it saves your sanity and why it saves your time and your clients time? Absolutely. I had to create it this way because if I'm consulting CEOs and marketers to fill that gap, it has to resonate and connect with both of them and you'll have finance directors in the room sometimes. Let's give an example of something that, let me think, that is not about leads, okay? Let's say there's a company who are having issues with customer retention. So that means they're not keeping hold of customers as much as they would like to be. So they're losing clients to a cheaper competitor. That's That, could, that must be a really common thing. A lot of the time, marketers don't even know retention rates in their business. They don't know. They're just so obsessed with getting leads for sales because that pressure it's really good to know, are we keeping clients and are they happy? Since the definition of marketing from the CIM is satisfy customer needs profitably. doesn't say leads anywhere in there, does it? You know, get customers, Mm -hmm. of course, but satisfy them and make a profit. That just to me is in such a nutshell. So with this issue, okay, I'm talking to a CEO and a marketer, what's our collective company focus as a result of this? As a company, as a whole, our entire body, our focus is going to have to be, how do we increase our retention rate? Let's say we've dropped, we're supposed to be at about 86% and we've dropped to 79% over time. God, these could be terrible numbers, I don't know. But how do we get ourselves back up to 84%, 86% retention rate in a certain amount of time? Like we need to get back to that. And so you could say, okay, marketing's goal is going to be get... 50 demos booked in with existing clients to show them a new feature, a new product and get them really back engaged in what we're doing and why we're better and all that stuff. Like that is an activity they could do. The problem with that is that we forget about the bigger issue as to why a customer is wanting to leave us. And so the format that I would follow is, okay, understand what the company focus needs to be. That's the top level one. Next level down is set the marketing objective. And I'll go into what that would be in this example. Next level down. So number one, company collective focus. Number two, the marketing objective. Number three, the key result. 
Number four, what activities are we going to do? And number five, what are the success indicators? So let me run through that example. So the company collective focuses increase our retention rate back up to 86%. What are we all going to do as a business to get to that is a big focus. One of six focuses we've got, because we've also got tech issues and we've also got culture issues with employees. Like that's one of the strands of focus. So the marketing objective would become, let's think, the marketing objective would be get closer to our clients to understand what they need from us and deliver it. Okay. And so that's the objective that we focus our effort around. How are we going to do that? Then the marketing, the key result would be along the lines of the smart thing, which is we really want to, the, the key result that will tell us this has worked. Obviously the overall company key result is get the 86% retention rate achieved, but the marketing key result could be the NPS score, the net promoter score will become higher. We're currently at six out of 10, we'll be at eight out of 10. And the other one is that we will secure 70 meetings between our best clients that we're worried about losing and our experts or our people through a series of nurturing them. And that's where the activities come in. Now, the reason that the marketing objective is not the measurable one is because it makes sure that we're focusing on the right thing. So when we get into stage four, which is activities, we're not looking just at the key result of how do I get 50 demos? What's the best way to get 50 demos? Okay, just hammer them, hammer them, hammer them, pass them, pass them, get the demos, get the demos. It's more, oh, our goal is get closer to clients to understand what they need, why they're leaving us and how to keep them. I think we're going to start with some insight work. Let's figure out what it is that's going on here and then feed that back to key account departments and customer departments and make sure that everyone puts in place a plan to ensure they actually are having a great experience. I did this in a client's company. It was like, look, guys, the person answering the phone is really needing to change. People are having a really poor first impression. It's like a, hi, what is it? Oh, no, he's not in. Right, yeah, I'll, I'll try and pass the message on. Oh, okay, bye, bye, bye. And it was like damaging. So it was like, right, virtual PA service, done, perfect, sorted. This client is having issues with that. And on an account basis, like really making improvements directly. So it's not just about plastering over the symptom of like, get a demo in and tell them why we're good. It's actually changing it. And then success indicators being the last one is like, what tells us that we're on the right track to achieving these key results? So this is where something like web visits could come in. If, if, it's, if it is based on leads, you need 50 leads within six months. A success indicator could be 150 webinar signups because we know that we usually get more clients when we have webinars or downloads of our podcast has increased by 50% or we've had way more website visitors. That's where you can use those things. But what tends to happen is people are using success indicators as the overall marketing objective. And that's what I find happens. So I hope that explains a kind of the way I do it I like that it's much more holistic too yeah. because you're looking for a number of different solutions like in that example to get closer to clients rather than just that one so yes that is smart but Yay. not in the traditional smarter, smart way. The smarter smarter. Way. But again, I'm not I'm not dissing smart goals used correctly they'll be way better than not having goals at all it's just that I found it brain as a marketer. I was like, I'm I'm frying my own head here. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. I'm obsessed over, am I completing every S M A R T? Oh no, it's not really it yeah, I just I couldn't do it. It doesn't solve the core problem. It just it just freaked me out. I, I don't really like processes. I like them to be as simple and I don't like KPIs. I like success indicators, key results, like just normal language, anything jargon, I'm just like, ugh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's too much jargon. You're, you're preaching to the choir here, Jade. <laughs> like, I, I know that. That's why I'm here we, talking to you because we're the same. Yeah. We don't have time for that that word salad <laughs> at all. Oh my goodness. Circling back and putting a pin in things. Yeah, this is why I can't ever work in corporate again. I just, I can't. I just can't. I, I can't keep my mouth shut and I get into trouble because <laughs> I just go BS on that kind of stuff. I'm like, do, really do we have to do this and it took me a while to unlearn that when I started my own business I actually had a client and we had previously worked together and we were like writing these reports and stuff 
And then we kind of looked at each other and we're like, why are we doing this? It's like a habit. It's a hangover from our corporate days. We don't need to do this. How about we spend the two hours that we're putting together this report that nobody's reading on something, you know, more useful for the business that's actually going to help grow the business. And I think there's a good piece of advice for B2B marketers is we usually, and I say this because I've done it, it's not an attack. We usually use jargon because we feel defensive because people don't understand us. But what it does, it pushes us further away. If you can speak in a boardroom using normal language that people understand, you're getting buy-in. So I think maybe because I'm from a sales background, I've always been happy doing that. It's like, I need to sell this to you. And I know that using big words that are going to make you roll your eyes might make me sound clever, but it won't actually get us anywhere. Mm. Good tip. I like that. I I can Um, think of a very good Australian proverb, quote unquote, that would go well here, but we haven't cursed yet in this episode. So maybe we 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 don't have to tick that explicit (laughs) box if we keep going how we are. So. Like I'll, I'll say we're not here to fudge spiders, so why use the the word salad jargon? That exactly, way? literally. Oh like, goodness. look, I I don't mind expletives. It's, you have to survive it to to be a parent. I think mm. yes. you have to. You have to... Oh, God, sorry. Jade, it sounds like you've worked with quite a number of large organisations as well as some small to medium-sized organisations. What do you believe are the advantages that small business owners or small businesses have in comparison to some of these larger corporations when it comes to their marketing? I think there are many opportunities, but I think that unfortunately not many go for them because you find that in larger corporates, like they tend to get marketing a lot better and they follow in best practice. Like you look at IBM, Adobe, those types of businesses, like they just do great marketing. It's not even a debate that marketing would drive the growth of the business. There's a a great case study from EY as well. I learned at the Adobe, if people just Google Adobe EY, they used to be called Ernest Young they're just absolutely trail like they're just amazing at b2b marketing so yeah there's that but the other side is that small businesses can adapt and change and move faster so like i've been quite heavily involved in my husband's business in the past there are 15 like there were 15 heads when i was there and we could adapt fast it's like just change we can just do it let's just assess get the temperature on clients let's get the crm sorted let's get the data strategy sorted whereas when i was in a big global corporate you know, if we need a new CRM, it was like a 12 month project because you've got so many different layers of people. And so that's probably the biggest one I would say is this idea of you can change, you can move, you can decide to adapt. You know, when you look at my business, I will overhaul a service in a day once I've realized I want to as a person on my own. And when you're a team of like four people on the board, it's like how amazing that you can just change. Sadly, though, they don't. They talk for hours. A lot of companies, not all, they'll talk and talk and talk. Oh, we haven't got the bandwidth for that right now. And it's like, I think the biggest missed opportunity in in these smaller B2Bs is that they're just not outsourcing to experts enough. They're trying to do everything themselves. They're trying to be an expert at everything. It's like, just get the specialists in the room, tell them the problem, let them sort it out, get it done. Like, you're not moving fast enough. You, you're stagnating and they're just not seeing it. But the ability to be able to move fast is the biggest one, I would say. What would you say to people who argue, well, we don't have the budget for that. We don't have the budget to bring in that expert. Well, that's just a view on you know what you want to achieve and, la- and lack of business strategy then. Because if you have a vision to where the business needs to get to, you then need to line up what resources you're going to need and what the big fixes need to happen. So if you've recognized that you're not growing as best you can and you're not as profitable because your systems and your tech are not well set up, it's going to be, there's always an element of risk in investment. You're going to need to do something now, you can be innovative so that it's not like a billion pounds, but, you know, there's CRM systems that can be overhauled. You know, you have a few days consulting with a specialist. They get the right system in view. They set it all up correctly and you're done. It's not about like millions of pounds, but it is about figuring out what are the big things we need and what are we going to focus on first? Yes, if you're like, you need 20 experts across 20 different things, it's unrealistic, but I think 
people don't factor in the cost of themselves per hour and how much they're putting into something that is just broken. And it's like, oh, step out and invest in this. You know, there's things that B2Bs won't invest in that I probably would invest in. Like, I'm going to overhaul my brand positioning soon because I want to invest in that. And I'm like, if I as a person just earning on my own will do this, it's amazing to me that a 10 million turnover business won't invest in that. But I think the other point goes back to not seeing that there's a return to be had in marketing. So it's like, oh, we can't spend because it's seen as a cost. Whereas when it actually drives growth, you're like, well, if, if you, I often try to remove myself from it. I'm not pushing you to do anything. I'm like if you would like to double in size in three years, you will need this level of investment. If you don't want to do that, that's absolutely fine. But you can spend years and years and years trying to do that doubling thing and not changing anything and you'll just be in the same position. So it's up to you guys what you do. Oh my gosh. I love that message. I'm going to take that for my next webinar, I think. (laughs) Do it. Yeah. You should. You can just keep doing the same thing and that's, that's fine. Do do whatever works. Like, oh, but we don't need that growth. Well, don't, don't invest then. Stay where you are. That's absolutely fine too. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. You know? Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Well, I think we've got a few little quick fire questions to wrap things up because they these are always fun. But before we get into those, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom, Jade. I've learned a lot from this episode. I'm sure you have too, Clem. It's been oh, yeah. incredibly insightful. So thank you. I, I think we could go on for another hour and another hour, but it's now what? It's 8.30 here in <gasps> in Australia 8 30 at night <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure Krishna hasn't eaten just same as me so but Jade it's been I mean this has been a long time coming and I have to say this is probably one of this is at the top of my list is one of the fav- my most favorite interviews that we've done so far mm-hmm. we it's been such a pleasure to speak to you guys it's 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 been I don't know how long that we've been TikTok friends and how long we've been back and forth and the fact that we're now here and I've just my brain is exploding with so much knowledge now that that you've shared that just thank you like I I'm absolutely grateful that you've come on here. No, I, I'm so grateful you invited me because I was quite taken aback when you invited me because your honeybee social. You, your pinned post really inspired me like your your style of saying here's the ways I can help you and I tried to emulate it a couple of times I was like I'm just not getting this right like I can't get that chilled vibe that you have and after a wine <laughs> just so you know right this marketing, is the ma- another marketing tip that, just have a few yeah, wines and record your tiktoks <laughs> that's why I nailed this intro with no mistakes <laughs> I think you were like, I promise this. I promise you that I will not do this. I will. And I thought, oh, that's good. I like that. So yeah, I was very honored when you asked me to come on. I need, I need to review it now because I don't even remember what I did. It's brilliant. Don't change it. <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right. A few quick questions to wrap things up. Jade, as a busy mum in business, what top tip or tool or strategy helps you most? And you mentioned earlier that up until recently, you only had six hours a week of work time. So you must have some incredible strategies under your belt. Is that the right term? I don't know. But <laughs> let us let us know what those are. I think something I've always been happy to do is like, just always do what you want. Don't spend any of your time on anything you don't want to be doing if you look at a project and you sign you think oh just bin it just bin it off I don't mean like sack a client I just mean as your future strategy so for me I've got to a place where if there's something in my diary it is billable you know with a client there's I only sell the power hours and they're billable so for me it's like if I've got eight hours of calls in my diary this week I am earning off every second that I'm away from my children and so I think that there's a guy, a guy, a, a, a guy who said the most efficient person in the entire world will be a working mum because we do not have time for the junk. We're like, right, just get to the, what are we doing? Let's get on with this. So I think the the power of your vision as to what you want to be doing is just transformative because when you don't have time, it's like, look, I do the power hours, the webinars, the podcast episodes and the TikToks. That's all I do. Nothing else. Like I'll post on Instagram every now and then and LinkedIn every now and then, but that's all I do. If you want to 
maybe have a brand partnership three or four times a year, fine. And lovely things like this, which I just enjoy. It's like, that's it. I think people get too wrapped up in loads of different things. And as long as you like it, why not? But yeah, I just decided very early on to just only do what I want because any time that I'm doing something I don't want to be doing, it's time away from my kids and that like wrecks me inside. I hate the thought that I'm doing something I don't want to do and I could be with them. That I don't want that to sound like a privileged standpoint because I understand that we got to work and we've got to earn the money. When I first started out, that wasn't the case. It's taken me nine years to get to this point. And so obviously you've got to balance that with like needing to earn the money. But yeah, it's like having that vision of what do you want to be doing and where do you want to get to? That would be my biggest tip. Amazing. And the more of that that you do, so the more of the work that you love doing, you attract more of those kind of clients or customers by doing that work and talking about that work. And so it does sort of feed into itself. So amazing. Yeah, it's like being, it's it's having those, I, I don't ever talk about anything, anything other than you need a strategic marketing plan and you don't have brand positioning, the marketing gap, that's it. I talk about it all the time. So don't be tempted to go into just other random areas. Just know what you, you add value and where you're super expert at. Because in my content, if someone attacks me in it, I'm like, I got this. I know what I'm talking about. If I did content about SEO, I know a general bit about it. But if someone attacked me, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to say. I was wrong. So yeah, just just only talking about (laughs) someone else. But yeah, just really being firm on where your expertise lies. I mean, comfortable with what you don't know as well. I don't know. I said that on on a webinar the other day. They asked me a question. I said, I don't know the answer to that one. You'll have to ask a specialist because I don't know. (laughs) Can't know, can you? what's your favorite social media strategy or tactic at the moment is there is there something that you're doing that's working really well or that your clients that you've recommended that they do and that's that's working well and they're just repeat 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 I the best strategy that I have and unfortunately it's for TikToks it's just where I spend my time is to plan to a degree your main content that you post. So say like you did three a video, three videos a week where you're giving something valuable about a topic and then be driven by the comments. So it's like a really nice machine then. So like say I post three videos and then I just reply video, reply comment with video. It just kind of fuels this nice engine of, of organically engaging with my community and being led by them. And so I respond to as many comments as possible by video and I respond to every single comment on TikTok. And there were 1,700 comments last month. And so it was a big job. But I was like, if I want to help marketers, I have to be all in. You're either helping them or you're not. So if that means I've got to reply to each and every one, sometimes I'll say, yeah, but tell me what what industry you're in so I can understand what you're struggling with. It's like, Sometimes we get so obsessed with wanting more followers that we forget about the people there. So for me, it's that community element, whichever platform you're on, like a comment, even if you get three a month, comment, like go all in, like support that person and help them. Yeah, amazing. And of course, having those conversations in your comments is going to help with that post performance or the video performance as well. So totally, it helps you as well, as well as them. Yeah. Okay, sales pitches in LinkedIn DMs. Your thoughts? <laughs> Do we like them? Do we not like them? I think I that know my look thoughts says it all. <laughs> For I don't. Listening, you should have just seen the look that it was on Jade's face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're just done really badly. So I think Sales Navigator can be a good element to a marketing strategy but you usually find like a good example and I've never diss a brand name in real life but I had one from a company saying like we would like to help you edit your podcast because you must be really busy we love your podcast just generically we just love your podcast like yeah of course and I replied to say hey I'm super fine just doing it on my own for a minute I'm not you know I'm just it's basic it's simple I'm cool but it's good to know you exist because then in the future if I do need anything and then they put yeah, no problem. I'll be back in touch in a year and see how you're getting on. Well, nurture me, send me resources. Like here is a guide on, here's a video on what the best you, the best podcasters are doing and how you can like help me with where I am, become my trusted ally. 
and nurture me. I genuinely, I always think about it. Should I be paying for someone to edit my podcast? And if a brand, none of them have yet, if a brand decided to nurture me and help me, they're the ones I would pick. And that's the biggest missed marketing opportunity. So it's not necessarily the outreach that's the problem. It's the fact that there's no marketing, no brand building. Like, hi, are you in the market? No, you're not. Okay, I'll try again in a year. It's like, but when I am in the market, I'm not going to just go, yeah, I'm in the market. Let's talk. I'm going to research online. I'm going to say, who's the best? I'm going to ask you guys, do you use someone? I'm going to ask business babies and bossing it because theirs is beautifully edited. I'll be asking that. So if you want to nurture me, it can work. If you just want to spam me, it's not going to work. And you've got to forget that they exist because they've disappeared for a year. It's like when you receive an email from someone, you're like, who is this? Yeah. You know, for an email, like an EDM, where perhaps you'd signed up to something, a freebie or something months ago, and you've never heard from them since. And suddenly you get an email and you're like, I don't know who you are, unsubscribe. And because and also it feels been... desperate. It feels desperate because it's like, if you were really good, like you say, you'd be the person that I'm finding when I'm researching it and people be recommending. And that's where brand building is so important is that people buy like that. They they ask for recommendations and that's where it is a people business. Mm. Crystal, do you mind if I ask the fun question? Sure. Okay. PG tips or Tetley's? PG tips, absolutely. Do you know is the that... piano's on my foot? <laughs> did, did you it, find that ad in the UK? Because we had that in New Zealand with the no. monkeys moving a piano down the stairs. But do you um... know, I don't even drink tea. So, like, I'm not a very good Brit, am I? No, it's so un British of you. I do not That's like tea. I don't we like have... Vlog, so, I'm not a good Kiwi. <laughs> We have relatives who like only drink tea. Like it is very British. Like we only drink tea, but yeah, I'm a coffee girl, but they've certainly got, you must have PG tips in your cupboard as a British household. Like if someone came over and there's no tea, that's disgraceful. It's funny. The the one, one of my, my older, oldest friends is British and that, that was it. He said, you have to have PG tips. And so, and every time he came and visit, he made sure there was a box of PG tips. In the oh, it's embarrassing. Okay. I'll have a cup of tea. Oh, oh we don't have, what? How terrifying. <laughs> but yeah, I, I always, Tetley's is more cozy and it's marketing and advertising, isn't it? It's quite cozy mm. and comforting and quite northern, I think, in the UK. And then PG Tips is like the fun, was it the monkey? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yes, I remember that as a kid because in, in New Zealand, well, and I'm showing my age now, as a Gen X, as all will say, mm. but growing up, we had a lot of English TV shows and even like our news anchors had English accents when I was very young. So everybody had more of, you know, they rounded vowels as opposed to now that I live in Australia, it's probably flattened out a little bit. But yeah, so we had a lot of English ads as well. So I just always remember that one with the monkey. We love our tea. We love it. Um, yeah. One final question then to wrap things up, because I'm sure you have got things to get on with as well for today. And that is, what's one thing that you wish the sales team understood about marketing? If you could wave your magic wand and they would automatically know that, like, you know, Neo Matrix style plugged in, <laughs> what would it be? I think that I have an empathy for salespeople because I was one and I remember thinking marketing were a waste of space and they didn't do anything. They got to have all the fun. So there was a resentment and a jealousy there. Like, oh, look at them over there in the ivory tower. They do whatever they want. And so I made it my mission in corporate to make friends with salespeople and like educate them and stuff. So one thing I would try and help them to understand is that marketing is a much deeper process than they think. So if they just came over to me and said, hey, I need this tomorrow, I'd be like, well, that's not happening. And this, ha- this was after building a relationship. It wasn't just defensive to them. I would help them understand and say, look, come sit with me. Let me show you the process. Let me understand what's behind what you're asking for. You've come over here with a great idea. It was a rubbish idea. With a great idea, I want to understand what issue you're trying to solve because I love that you come up with ideas for us. Let me help you like figure out like what we're doing here. And you know, you've got so much insight from your customers. I want to harness that and I want to take your idea and make it something. And so I what I used to try and get them to understand was the process behind what we do. So I wish they understood that process, but it's not a wish, it can happen. If we educate them and build relationships with them and actually not take their crap you know 
actually by being firm, salespeople will back down. I did a TikTok the other day because a guy did a really mean video about marketers. Someone had asked him in comments, why are salespeople so mean to marketers? And he replied mm. on video and he goes, yeah, so who's going to tell them, guys? I think it's probably because marketing are meant to get leads, but they end up just doing a bunch of activities that don't drive leads. And that's why we're mean. And And I don't think he's a bad guy. I think he just got caught up in the bazaars of that. But I did a video reply to be like, hey, do you know what? There's never a reason to be mean to anyone at work. However, let me confirm a few things. And I was really, you know, intentional with it. I was like, yeah, you've got a point. Marketing are not getting leads. And let me tell you why. And he immediately backed down in the comments. He's like, Jade, this is very insightful and thoughtful. And I really respect what you're saying. And I wasn't being mean. It's like, yeah, you were. You were being mean, but I'm glad you've backtracked now. And so I think if you're struggling with a mean salesperson, there's something really simple you can do. And this is not from any leadership coaching or background in anything psychological, but I used to do it. Oh, the problem with you marketing people, blah, blah, blah. I'd go, I would say, how do you mean? And make them, make them go through with it. Go on. How do you mean? And not even in like a, but like, oh, right, that's interesting. You think that, how do, how do you mean? All right, do you have an example of when that happened? Okay, because that's not my understanding of how websites work. Do you, would you like me to show you our website report so you can see how it all works? No, all right, okay, great, have a good day. And they're like, oh, I didn't, didn't mean it like that. <laughs> so actually a lot of it's bravado. So, so you're saying be, be a parent, be a mum. It is parenting, yeah, because <laughs> any... Any behavior that's not kind at work is always like a child child approach, isn't it? So mm-hmm. yeah, treat like at, at home, we practice respectful parenting. And so it's the same sort of thing, you know, it's like, all oh, right, I'm interested to understand more about what it is that you're, what's happening there and your thought process there. And oh, okay, like curiosity, not defensiveness is what I would say. Mm-hmm. Excellent. What I'm hearing is, yeah, <laughs> I can see you're really upset. <laughs> Yeah. And if you have to be, it's like, hey, you know what? I don't get spoken to like that. And I don't appreciate the the, the way in which you're coming across there. Your email was really unkind. And I don't I don't think that was appropriate. Could we speak about this in a more professional way? And like that takes a lot of confidence and experience to get to that place. But once you do, the word kind of spreads like don't mess with marketing because you will in embarrass yourself it's kind of like that it's like mm. let them show themselves up don't you don't need to be like them and mean back or defensive about yourself it's like show me who you are oh okay why are you being like that you don't need to be like that I don't accept that and so yeah but it, it's hard don't mess with marketing we're getting jackets okay guys <laughs> don't mess with marketing stickers you name it love it all right. So Jade, we know that you hang out on TikTok. Is there anywhere else on the internet that people would usually find you or are they really best to go connect with you there? Yeah, I think the best thing to do is I'm B2B Jade on pretty much everything. So that's TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn. I'm Jade Tambini. They're my main platforms. I do have a lot of webinar replays on my YouTube channel, B2B Jade TV. And if they would like to check out the podcast, that's a pretty good place to start. So that's the B2B Marketing Gap podcast. It's just in the link in all my bios. There's a ton of different templates and resources and stuff. If people need anything, then always around. So yeah anything at all you need just ask amazing Jay. and yeah, yeah. we'll link to everything in the show notes of course to make it easy for our listeners to find you and to yeah explore those other resources that you have yeah. jade it's been absolutely phenomenal this is just a great way to end the day for us thank you so much for coming on great way to start the day for me i mean it's 10 to 12 i'm like so hungry now because i only had a piece of toast for breakfast my five-year-old made a family breakfast this morning that's a new thing she's put all place cards out and my toddler is going to be back from forest school in a minute she's gone with her dad which is really nice because he's so busy and he never usually has bandwidth to do that so she'll be coming in any minute and we can have some lunch and i'm going to try and switch off and just be with her for the afternoon so yeah oh, amazing oh thank you once again so nice chatting thanks guys i will see you soon thank bye-bye you. all right just stay on for just uh, a <laughs> all right just stay on <laughs> oh yeah one sec let me